So when you first start to study a particular field, it seems like you have to memorize a zillion things. You don't. What you need is actually to identify a few core principles, generally 3 to 12 of them that governs the field. So the million things you thought you have to memorize are simply various combinations of the core principles. So this was a quote from Succeeding by John Reed. Fortunately or unfortunately, I have not read that book yet. But I actually lifted the quote from this one instead. So this is Same as Ever by Morgan Housel. So I just finished it. I love the book. So I think you should add it to your reading list soon. And I have many reflections along the way. And this video is one of them. So this book, Same as Ever, started with an interesting conversation that set the stage. So I once had lunch with a guy who's close to Warren Buffett. So this guy, we'll call him Jim, was driving around Omaha with Buffett in the late 2009. So the global economy was crippled at this point, and Omaha was no exception. Stores were closed, businesses were boarded up. Jim said to Warren, it's so bad right now, how does the economy ever bounce back from this? So Warren said, Jim, do you know what the best-selling candy bar was in 1962? No, Jim said. Snickers, said Warren. And do you know what the best-selling candy bar is today? No, said Jim. Snickers, Warren said. Then silence. That was the end of the conversation. The founder of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, made a similar remark some time back. And I quote, I'm often asked about what is going to change in the next 10 years. And I almost never get the question, what is not going to change in the next 10 years? And the second question is actually the more important of the two, unquote. So if you were to really think about it, in any established field, from physics to chemistry, mathematics to even geology, there are fundamental laws that govern the entire body of knowledge. And once you have a deep appreciation of them, everything else is just a derivative or an iteration. So like the title of this video suggests, I'll distill the core principles of value investing through my own lens. So it's not meant to be exhaustive, but do feel free to leave in the comments down below if you disagree or have anything to add. Principle 1, the big C word, compounding. So if you have taken any finance class before, the first lesson is more often times than not about time value of money. So long story short, money today is worth more when compared to money tomorrow. Why, you might ask? So the two most common reasons, inflation and opportunity cost. So let's assume that you are in a well-functioning economy, experiencing some level of inflation. And let's say it inflates at a rate of 3% per year. So the same dollar today will be worth 97 cents the next year. Furthermore, not forgetting that your dollar today can be kept somewhere to generate some sort of interest or returns, whether is it through a government bond, a corporate bond, an investment vehicle, options, etc. Thereby creating this so-called gap, called opportunity cost. So the greater shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function, said physicist Albert Barlett. So time value of money as a concept is the first lesson to most undergraduate of finance that explains the power of compounding in a subtle way. So have you came across this infographic before? So this is the result of inflation over the last 100 years. And as Albert Einstein suggests, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it, earns it. He who doesn't, pays it. Compounding also works in reverse too, especially to those that think that Oh, inflation, 3% a year, no biggie. So concepts like having a long time horizon, holding period being forever, stay in the investing game, and if you want to finish first, you must first finish, etc. etc. are all explaining the same root concept, compounding. So Howard Marks, who's a billionaire investor, once talked about an investor whose annual returns were never ranked in the top quartile, but over a 14-year period, he was in the top 4% of all investors. So if he keeps those mediocre returns up for another 10 years, he may be the top 1% of his peers, one of the greatest of his generation, despite being unremarkable in any given year. So much focus in investing is on what people can do right now. This year, maybe next year, what are the best returns I can earn? Seems like an intuitive question to ask. But like evolution, that's not where the magic happens. 
If you understand the math behind compounding, you realize the most important question is not how I earn the highest return. It's what are the best returns I can sustain for the longest period of time. So some of you have been wondering, why do I recommend Weibo so much? Firstly, I'm an avid user of their platform. So their charts are intuitive, they allow free access to market data and even premium level 2 codes. They are one of the best brokers due to the low commission structure for both stocks and options. And they are also regulated by the Singapore authorities. So for those wondering about the custodian relationship, Weibo has appointed DBS Bank as the custodian of their customers' money. So monies belonging to the customer must be and will be kept in this trust account for safekeeping, separated from all the other monies belonging to Weibo or for other purposes. So your monies are definitely in good hands. And on top of all of these, Weibo always extends incredible rewards and campaigns for both new and existing users. So I'll leave the campaign details in the description box down below. And don't miss out on all these freebies. So thank you Weibo for sponsoring this video. Principle number two, incentive is everything. Many people draw comparisons between investing and gambling. So both requires you to put capital up front, assume a certain level of risk, betting on an uncertain outcome. And you either walk away a winner or a loser, depending on whether you have made money or not. So it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. So is it a duck? To me, the key difference is around the odds and the payoff. So when you enter or you gamble in a casino, they're out to make your money. So casinos are not charity organizations. They're not here to hand out money to you. So once you acknowledge this relationship and this incentive system, you know that in the long run, if you gamble long enough, you'll lose out. But in investing, however, there are no fixed odds. Results are always determined in hindsight. Better still, the payout is unconfirmed, unlike a blackjack or a roulette table. So if you hold a good company long enough, and you allow for principle one to kick in, which is the power of compounding, you'll be printing so much cash. And if you're able to understand and appreciate the incentive structure in a particular system, you'll actually have a skill set most investors would die for, which is a sneak peek into the future. So incentives actually drives actions and actions ultimately drives outcomes. And Boeing is actually a recent case study of how a misguided culture and incentive system led to a series of issues like missing boats, missing doors, and missing wheels, where the focus over the last decade was on financial engineering with zero conversations around real engineering and safety in mind. So understanding incentives will allow you to appreciate popular quotes like market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. So incentives drives the world in crazy ways. Principle number three, think like a business owner. Usually, when people talk about investing, they are basically speaking from a third-person perspective with little to no skin in the game, despite ironically enjoying or even suffering from potential financial gains or losses from their investments. So it seems like buying into a stock is buying into numbers or alphabets on an app or on a platform with no real-world implications. And drawing back to the previous point, the structure and incentive systems of brokerages, banks, money managers alike are all working against you. Brokers want you to trade more. Banks want to leverage your monies with low interest. Managers want to earn a fee from you. Heck, it's even better that you treat this like a game. Trading in and out so that the brokers can earn more commissions from you. Make the game as hard as possible so you think that it's an insurmountable task to invest on your own and you trust these managers with your money so that they can levy a 5% entry load and a 2% ongoing charge per annum. On the flip side, if you start thinking like a business owner and treat investing as if I'm buying into a particular business, you will want to understand how the business operate. You want to know how they make money. Why will consumers continue to patronize you? What's preventing competitors from eating your lunch? What's your unique advantage? Or what's your economic mode, as Warren Buffett puts it? Who are you hiring? What's the quality and characteristics of this management team in place? Are they allocating capital effectively? And when you set this particular environment up for yourself, you'll inevitably ask questions that will improve your odds in picking a good company 
for the long run. Principle number four, margin of safety. So as Benjamin Graham puts it, the purpose of the margin of safety is to render the forecast unnecessary, unquote. So the more flexibility you have, the less you need to know what happens next. So the long term is less about time horizon and more about flexibility. If you haven't realized by now, the investment business is one that is filled with uncertainty, self-doubt, emotional gyration, and insert any bad terms you have in mind. If you have a huge margin of safety, you can be wrong on a lot of things, but still make it out in one piece to the other side. The inverse is true too. If everything is priced in and the outlook seems perfect, anything far from perfect will destroy wealth. So from this concept of margin of safety, you see discussions being extended into the difference between growth investing and the future expectations versus value traps. Price is what you pay, value is what you get. It's better to buy a wonderful company at a fair price than a fair company at a wonderful price. Um, you have different models like a discounted cash flow model that tries to estimate the present value of all expected future cash flows, etc., etc. So everyone is giving their best shot in estimating the value of a particular stock or its underlying business. And intuitively, everyone wants to buy things at a discount. The issue? It lies in knowing the true value of something because everything is uncertain and we only have the benefit of hindsight. And by appreciating the concept of a margin of safety keeps you grounded in the realities of your expectations and also your projections so that you won't just buy about anything just because. Last but not least, principle number five, second order thinking. So in one of Howard Marks' memo, he emphasizes the importance of thinking beyond the obvious and consider the implications of actions beyond the immediate effects. So to use some simple examples to illustrate the differences. First level thinking says that, oh, it's a good company, let's buy its stock. Second level thinking says, it's a good company, but everyone thinks it's a great company. And it's not. So the stocks might be overrated and even overpriced today. Let's sell. First level thinking says that the outlook calls for low growth and rising inflation. Let's dump the stock. Second level thinking says, oh, the outlook stinks, but everyone else is selling in panic. Let's buy. First level thinking says, I think the company's earnings will fall. Let's sell. Second level thinking says, I think the company's earnings will fall far less than people expect and the pleasant surprise will actually lift the stock. Let's buy. So I think through the different examples, you'll realize that the thinking required is much more nuanced and complex. The asset prices in the markets today reflect and depend on the expectations of all market participants. So most people tend to ignore the part that others play in how prices change. So from this idea, you'll morph into the whole study around contrarian thinking, risk taking, and what's your edge in this investing game, etc, etc. And I hope that this video serves as a good foundation for those of you that are new to investing and a refresher course for those of you that are veterans of the stock market. And feel free to leave in the comments down below on what other principles that you live by in this game of investing. And I'll see you in the next video, but more importantly, I'll see you on the moon. Goodbye.